Hi there, my name is Karen O'Connor. Hi Karen, this is Mr. Opera. I'm going to tackle a topic that many singers and singing teachers find confusing and intimidating, and that topic is vocal formants. That's my favorite. That's literally my favorite. This is going to be now, awesome. Now, I understand that singers are artists, not academics, primarily, and I certainly don't expect everybody to be as endlessly fascinated with voice science as I am. Since I'm a vocal nerd just like you, Karen, this is going to be awesome. We can talk about science and facts and stuff. Yeah! Formants are the resonance frequencies of the vocal tract. Now, every resonating cavity resonates at its own frequency. That's true. Now, our resonator tract, which extends from the top of the vocal folds in the larynx to the edge of the lips, or if the nasal port is open, to the nostrils. It's just a vocal tract. And if, if we could stick to the word vocal tract, I would really appreciate it. Just for your information, when, when you involve the nose, right, you, you, didn't, you didn't now make your vocal tract longer. And you didn't change what, like, what is the end of the vocal tract. When you're singing nasal and, and you have your nose open, it's not adding anything. It's only taking away. And the end of your vocal tract, when your nose is open, is still the end of your mouth. It doesn't change with your nose being open or closed. What your nose does is act as a Helmholtz resonator. Not to get too much into nitty gritty, but Helmholtz resonators are for taking away sound, for stripping away resonance. It has a bend, a potential second or side branch when the nasal port is open. Yeah, yeah, don't think of it that way. Think of opening your nose pri primarily as changing what's going on in your throat and in your mouth. When you open your nose, it's like you poked a hole in, in the tube and you drained off some resonance, but it's not going anywhere. So just think of, ah, I opened my nose, therefore I subtracted resonance from my vocal tract. But think of your vocal tract as all still, you know, just that same one resonator tract, R resonator tract. And it has all these little nooks and crannies in there. And some of those smaller cavities are resonators in and of themselves. They're capable of resonating at their own frequencies. Yeah, that's not how that works. I, f I, found, I found a website that, that I think is exactly the source she used to make this video. And so I'll, I'll link that in the video description and talk about what I found on that website in, in, a, in a moment. But just to be clear, there are no like independent pockets of resonance. There's no independent resonators. There's no area of your vocal tract functioning as its own resonator. There's just one resonator. So this means that our vocal tract, unlike a pipe and a pipe organ, is capable of resonating at multiple frequencies, which we call formants. That's not the definition of formants. Formant behavior is predicted by what's called perturbation theory. Perturbation theory tells us that when you have a closed tube like this and you you find the spots in the tube where waves have either a node or an anti-node. When you alter the width of the tube in that area, you will change the speed of sound. I'm not kidding. In that area of the vocal tract, for those waves, the speed of sound has changed. It's not constant. Therefore, a wave that normally would be too fast or too slow or too long or too short, same thing, can now be made to fit. And you can do that simultaneously while keeping the vocal tract at a certain length 
that allows you to resonate other waves that shouldn't be able to go with this wave that you're also resonating. So formants allow you to selectively, in some cases, but not all, selectively speed up or slow down so that waves that can't normally fit can be made to fit and we can resonate them. That's very different from what she's saying. What I'm saying is... I'm t I'm, what I'm telling you about is perturbation theory. Perturbation theory is something you can look up. There's math. There's detailed explanations of how the acoustics work. There is no detailed math or explanations for the model of acoustics that Karen O'Connor is presenting to us. The lower two formants, which are labeled the first and second formants, are those that are most relevant to speech or to vowel differentiation. That's correct. Now, for today, we're going to refer to the entire resonator tube or tract as the vowel cavity or the vowel space. I want you to keep this in mind that she seems to know it's just one, just, just one cavity. Now many singers and even some teachers mistakenly associate vowel formation with the mouth only. And I'm going to explain why this is kind of a slippery slope to go down and how it can lead to sort of shallow and poorly defined vowels. I had no idea people were doing this, but if they are, then okay, I, I agree. Now, let's just say for the sake of simplifying this topic, that the pharynx, which is the largest resonating cavity or vocal tracts, and therefore resonates at the lowest frequency, is the first formant space, while the oral cavity, which is the second largest resonating cavity, is our second formant space. Oh, Karen. I don't even know where to start with this. This is, this is just completely incorrect. That's not how formants work. There are no like separate pockets of resonance going on. But more importantly, if you were going to say second formant is somewhere, then you would think about the area right around the bend of your vocal tract, so your pharynx, like behind behind your tongue and stuff, and like up to your uvula, that that area. That area of your mouth can detune the second formant from the first formant. So you can make changes in there that will alter the second formant but not the first formant. So if anything, she's got this exactly backwards. Like if you were going to think of the areas of your voice affecting certain formants, well then you could think of like the, the rounding of your lips or the opening of your mouth or whatever affecting the first formant, which it does, but that also affects the second formant. So that's not the, it's not really a good way to talk about things, but you could talk about the second formant having some independence from the first formant when you move your tongue around and change the size of your vocal tract right where the anti-node is more in your pharynx or right where the node is by your uvula for the second formant. But anytime you change the first formant, you're already changing the second formant. So that's something to... I just wish this this idea that they're so se like separate in this way was, was never spoken, and then we wouldn't have to be confused by it. Now to state that the pharynx is the first formant space and the oral cavity is the second formant space, is a bit of an oversimplification. It's it's not just an oversimplification, it's dead wrong. In actuality, the interactions between the pharyngeal and oral cavities are far more complex than I'm making them out to be here. Changing the first formant, which is not, as she said, in your pharynx, it's the end of your mouth, 
It's the amount of twang. And it's going to be the, the actual, the, the length of your vocal tract is also going to affect your first formant behavior. Not second formant, Karen, first formant. Just to be clear, again, not second, first formant. The reason that that's not affected by changes to the second formant is that there's no node or anti-node there. We shouldn't expect that. So, the tongue, between the pharyngeal and oral cavities are far more complex than I'm making them up to be here, but we're just gonna go with this for today. So, the tongue is, it forms a movable partition between the pharynx and the oral cavity. We're gonna see that this is the mouth here. So when we form about E, for example, the tongue is high and it's fronted. Additionally, the jaw is in a near closed position. The, the two sets of teeth, the, the upper and lower rows of teeth, are nearly touching each other. So this means that there's actually very little space in the oral cavity for resonance, which means, and again, remember that smaller resonating cavities resonate at higher frequencies. This means that the, the second foramen is higher. Once again, that's just not how that works. Now the reason E, E, E has a higher second formant, or the reason we can say that, is because the space between my tongue and around my uvula, around my, my palate there, got smaller. But we can also say that it has a lowered second formant because the opening of my mouth is smaller. One of those things raises the second formant, the other one lowers it. So we can't really say something like, you know, your, your second formant is here, your first formant is here. That whole idea, it's, it's not that it's a simplification, it's that it's wrong. It's just wrong. It's, and it's not actually simpler. It's not simpler to tell people that your first formant is in your throat and your second formant is in your mouth. All of their experiences are going to contradict that. They will notice that rounding their lips lowers all the stuff you've been calling the first formant. That's a problem. And it's a problem not of simplification. It's a problem of having exactly the wrong information. If you think that reducing this resonant space is only raising things because smaller spaces have higher pitches, then you're not realizing that every time your lips get closer together, your first formant is going down. And that every time the area just underneath your uvula gets smaller, your second formant is going up, but not necessarily by itself. So at the same time, if you were, for instance, putting your tongue back just behind there into your pharynx, where there is an anti-node, then making that space smaller, we're talking about the same space and you're making it smaller, but that, that version of making things smaller makes the pitch go, makes the pitch go down. Again, not because we're changing the size of containers inside of our vocal tract, but because of this formant behavior that's predicted by perturbation theory, which I invite you to look up and read about. It's a lot more intuitive make, maybe than people like Karen are leading you to believe. Uh, they keep telling us like how scary and frustrating this is. And, and how complicated and, and how you need these simplified versions. But the simplified versions they give us are not really any simpler. They're just less correct. Now the all vowels on the opposite end of the extreme here. The, the tongue is low and back. Additionally, the mouth is open and the jaw is low, which means that there is an incredible amount of resonating space in the oral cavity, which makes it resonate at a lower frequency. It's not just that she got the labels wrong. It's that she gets the labels wrong and then she's, she's also teaching you a version of the laws of physics that doesn't make any sense at all. And 
She's teaching you these weird rules. Like, like a bigger space is gonna always lower the pitch. And the, the problem is that you, you actually need this information to be correct. If you're, if you're looking for strategies to lower the first format by opening your mouth, you're not going to get the results that you're looking for. At the same time, however, the tongue hump and its root have now encroached upon the pharyngeal space, making this space smaller and therefore the first formant frequency resonates at a higher frequency. Again, it's not about making a space smaller. Well, I mean, it is, but only if that space is an anti-node. If that space is an anti-node and you make it smaller, that's going to lower things. But right near your tongue, you know, when you go higher, towards the uvula, a little bit more forwards, constricting that space is going to make things brighter. Nothing to do with encroaching on the resonance space and we need more space to have more resonance. It doesn't work that way. Now, before I get too much further into this topic, I do need to take a moment to explain what harmonics and overtones are. Harmonics are the product of the sound source, and the case of the vocal instrument, the sound source is the vibration of the vocal folds, vibrating vocal folds. When the vocal folds come together, and the air begins to pass through them, they vibrate very rapidly, which chops the air into little puffs, which in turn creates a buzzing sound. Now, that buzzing sound is a complex tone made of multiple frequencies, which we call harmonics. The lowermost harmonic is also called the fundamental frequency, or the fundamental, and it's also called the first harmonic. It's what we perceive as pitch because it's the loudest of all the harmonics, and the other harmonics are labeled as such. Listen to this first sound. And now listen to this second sound. Which one sounds higher? The first one, right? But that's really weird. The first sound was a tone of 440 hertz. The second sound was comprised of a bunch of tones, all of which were 500 hertz or above. And yet, the second sound sounds lower than the first. That's really strange. I'll link the video about this in the description you should really check it out but just to be clear that's not true what she says you can have one of your harmonics actually be louder than the fundamental and we're not suddenly going to hear your your pitch being one octave higher or even two octaves higher it just doesn't work that way and we don't hear necessarily the fundamental as whatever is the loudest uh, harmonic. So this brings us to the question of how formants and harmonics interact with each other. We're essentially changing the frequencies at which the resonator resonates. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty correct. I mean, we, we know already that she's got all the details wrong about this, but nothing is incorrect in, in this statement really so in doing this this enables us to raise or lower those vowel formants and our goal ultimately is to try to raise or lower them so that th their frequencies align or match the frequencies of one or more of the harmonics of the voice source well that's uh, formant harmonic couplings is what she's talking about and that's not that's not really the only reason that you're using formants. You're also using them just, you know, to make your vowels and stuff. Um, but yeah, that's also correct that you, you have to, uh, combine your, your formant behavior with, with the pitch that you're singing. And that's what allows you to kind of maintain similar coordinations and raise the pitch and lower the pitch and change vowels and all that kind of stuff. That's true. And when that happens, when they do converge, when they come together, that creates a more powerful sound and it's more resonant, it's more rich and intelligibility is also assisted. Formants are how that works, but just to put it to you this way, if it's possible to <laughs> If it's possible to have the first formant and the second formant mixed up and mislabeled, 
and still run one of the most successful voice teaching businesses around. How much do you think voice teachers are actually using this? Now, we have no control over the harmonics except to change our phonation frequency. That is, to change the pitch at which we are singing. That's true. So every time the fundamental frequency, our pitch, moves up or down, the harmonics, the rest of the harmonics in the series, move up or down with it. That is, that is true. So this leaves them as kind of moving targets when it comes to resonance tuning. Uh, if you look at an instrument that can't change its length, and also, you know, doesn't have uh, the ability to use formant behavior to do this. You get an instrument that can't play all the pitches that it wants. Or, or that, that's going to have a really hard time playing some pitches. And uh, so being able to bend the math, if you will, is how we get so much done with, with this, like, I mean, compared to a trumpet or something, it looks like you shouldn't be able to do anything w with this kind of size tube. And uh, we're still able to do all these amazing things with it, like talk and, and opera singing and pop singing and all that stuff. And that's due to using this formant behavior to bend the math we we it's like ah the wave is a certain length wavelength you know then a certain frequency and everything and uh the speed of sound is is constant so so we can't get these waves to all fit together and play nicely and do what we want aha but we have this magic ability to change the speed of sound that's what's happening inside your vocal tract not only is that it's like it's not that complicated actually and it, on the other hand it is but it's also way cooler than what she's telling you now for singers to adjust our formants in order to tune them to a harmonic it's simply a matter of making subtle adjustments to our vocal tracks to our resonator tracks that is a lot more efficient if you actually have some idea of what adjustment you're making and why. Maybe you don't have to be the vocal nerd, but your teacher at least should understand. If, if you're going to be using a teacher to show you how to do this. If you're doing it yourself, yeah, you need to understand how formants work. And if you think they work the way that she said they do, you're going to sabotage yourself. Now, this is partly a matter of knowing which adjustments will cause which changes in the formant frequencies. So this is troubling, that you're telling us this is really important, but at the same time, your facts are demonstrably false. But it's largely a matter of experimentation. I agree with this. It is largely a matter of experimentation. Not only that, I would say that if you're honest about that, you may start to wonder, do I really need a teacher there all the time? What is, th if this is about experimentation, is a professional voice teacher the best way to introduce some variety into your experiments? Now for centuries, singers have been learning to tune their resonances and their teachers have been helping them do so without an understanding of what formants were. I wanted to make sure that Karen was was standing by this information and because it her video is five years old and I didn't want to just crucify her over this old video you know so I reached out to her and I recommended she put a disclaimer on there just because it's old info and maybe maybe she she understands now that this stuff isn't true I found her response actually though quite troubling and but then also interesting so in her response she singled out a, a, a point in the video where what she's saying happens to not be completely untrue but oddly you know if you just kept 
it, it, t it took less than a minute from the point where she told me to start watching before she said something that is like completely false. At the same time, however, the tongue hump and its root have now encroached upon the pharyngeal space making this space smaller and therefore the first form of frequency resonates at a higher frequency. It's really obvious to anyone who's singing that, you know, you pull your tongue back and put it in there and it lowers, it, it lowers the formant. You can hear it go down. And then that's also completely in agreement with, you know, every, if you just Google, uh, perturbation theory, they'll show you, and I showed you on the screen here, you know, where, where these nodes and anti nodes go that belong to each formant. Uh, so on, on top of using this kind of lawyer's defense, which, which is fine. Like I, I understand if someone out of the blue, after you've been praised by, by, you know, all these vocology people or whatever for your video, Someone comes out of the blue and says, "Wait a minute, this is all pseudoscience." I mean, you're not gonna you're not gonna be too happy about them being there. So I I understand, and um, but the next part of her response is actually what what triggered me to get a little bit more interested and dig a little bit deeper on where this information came from. Now, at first, I thought she must have gotten this from a web page called voicescienceworks.org. And if you go to this web page, you can find page after page of junk science, pseudoscience, quite a bit of it, um, including like, like an explanation of how, uh, you know, a bigger drum is going to have a lower sound uh, than a smaller drum, a lower pitch. And they're, they're, so they're telling you that because it's a smaller container, it has a smaller pitch and the bigger drum has a bigger pitch because it's a bigger container. And remember that smaller resonating cavities resonate at higher frequencies. This but that's not how that works. So the pitch of a drum is determined by the drum head, by the dimensions of the drum head, not, not the thing that it's attached to. Um, so that, I mean, really full of, of bad information on this site. And I thought she must have gotten it from them. You know, they have crazy stuff like, but, but they have exactly, they have diagrams that correspond to the pseudoscience model of acoustics that she is referring to. They even go as far as putting water bottles there and saying, imagine like your, your voice is, is different compartments and you have these water bottles full of air and you're going to change the size of these water bottles and they say that the water bottle in the back must be the first formant and then the one in the front must be the second formant i figured she got her information there but in her reply she gave me a clue that made this whole thing suddenly maybe a lot bigger than i thought she used the name dropping technique, uh, or the, the appeal to authority, if you will. And she pointed out that if, if I really, uh, have a problem with her acoustics, then I should take it up with some experts like Ingo Tietze and, uh, like Johann Sundberg. And she mentioned two more names. I was really confused by her mentioning Ingo Tietze and Johann Sundberg because both of these people have talked about perturbation theory. So both of these uh, acousticians would be more than familiar with what I'm saying here and what these mistakes are in Karen's video. But she also mentioned two more names. One of those names is Dr. Ken Bozeman. So when I saw this um, Pan American Vocology Association logo on the Vo Voice Science Works .org site, I started to wonder: maybe is this information 
coming from Dr. Ken Bozeman? Is he the one spreading this pseudoscience? So I checked out uh, Dr. Bozeman's website, and I also found uh, this, this clip from an interview he did with Karen using exactly the same language. So the language from his website uh, states that uh, the first or lowest formant is very much influenced by the pharyngeal throat part of the vocal tract, while the oral cavity has a greater influence on the second formant. Formants one or two are also perceived or felt somewhat more in the pharynx and mouth, respectively. That's exactly the same pseudoscientific model of vocal acoustics that Karen is talking about. They, they are distributing this information to the general public and educating people using this pseudoscientific theory as a basis. That is a really huge problem. And I'm a little bit in shock right now as I make as I make this conclusion for this video. So I don't know what what to do next actually.